Welcome back, Innovation Nation, and today we are going to talk about mid-drive conversion kits and if that's something you should consider. All right, so my friend here, his name, we'll just say he's also Mitch, is going to walk us through some of the pros about this particular mid-drive conversion kit. So, Mitch, let me know what uh, what was some of the things that stood out to you as being positive about this kit? Um, it's a good kit. It's got a uh, well-rounded balance for everything that you would want in a bike. You know, you can put it on a lot of different applications and um, it fits a lot of different bike frames and stuff like that, good sizes. So. And which and which frame is this that we're using it on? This is a Dayon 20 inch folding bike from 1999. So it, it's versatile for any type of bike you want to put it on. Okay, so so components wise, you're saying the components here were pretty good, pretty standard, pretty mid tier. Yeah. Yes. Now sir. was there was there anything in there, uh, just from the components perspective, uh, quality perspective, that wasn't quite up to snuff? Um, no, not really. The bike was a good bike to start with, so it always make sure that you have a good quality bike when you build this because it's going to put more stress on your drive terrain and everything else. So just make sure you have a really good quality bike. I would say not anything toy store or department store type bikes would mm. probably be something you would want to put this kit on so okay so you went through the process of working through it we've got some pictures of the process you sent some of those to me when you were building this what was your what was your first step so when i when i first saw the bike that you had here i believe it was just the rims and the frame was pretty much the way that i saw it so you had the you had the bike you had just on you know the uh the frames and you had the rims on it. What else did you do to this bike to kind of prep it for putting the kit on there? Um, the sensors for the motor is probably the biggest one and then making sure that you have a solid drivetrain that can handle it. And your gearing is, is probably an important. And then run, where you're gonna run your wires, you need to map out where you're gonna run your wires at and how you're gonna lay them out and stuff so they don't get tangled up in different things and your mm. brakes and all that stuff. So you wanna make sure you have a good plan of attack before you start the process okay excellent and so once you start the process you got the conversion kit in hand you're going to do it what was what was the first thing you kind of did as far as installing the conversion kit on here and then what and if you just walk through the process of actually installing the kit on on this frame uh, probably the biggest issue you're going to have is where your battery placement is going to be because that's your biggest factor in, in any bike is where you're going to put the battery and where you're going to run the wires the motors pretty much are a bolt up no brainer they bolt up one way there's only one way you can do it but the battery is probably your biggest factor and where you're gonna run your wires at and how you're gonna route things so they don't get tangled up and stuff and that's probably the biggest issue is to plan what you're going to do before you start doing it so you don't have to backtrack so much when you start the process okay so you plan out where the battery is going to be you installed the battery uh, right here on top of the uh, the down tube which is looking at the bike probably the only spot I mean, yeah, that was your choice, right? Yeah, that was my only choice. <laughs> installing it there. Um, so you did that, and then how did you go about installing? Let's talk about just specifically the motor here at the bottom. The motor has everything you're going to need with the kit. It's actually a pretty much a, a bolt-on kit. It goes, you remove your existing bottom bracket, everything that goes with it, even your cups okay. come out of the bottom bracket. You do not use any cups. You use everything they have in the kit with the Buffang kits. So it just goes in, and it seems kind of odd the way you put it in, but once you get everything snugged up and tightened, it actually fits perfect and it stays exactly where it's supposed to stay. And then there's a bracket that bolts to the motor and then it goes underneath the screw on cup that's on the other side that comes with the Bafang. So it's a self-contained system and you absolutely just get rid of everything that came with the stock cranks and bottom bracket because none of it gets used. Okay, excellent. So you installed the battery, we've got the motor put on here. Now, how did you go about, up here in the top we've got this screen and we've also got the keypad over here on the left hand side was there any issues running that or getting those plugged in and getting those to work properly no just like i said figuring out what you're adjusting on that panel is very important you need to know what you're doing before you start making things change and then your switch has to obviously be somewhere where you can get to it easy access so you don't if you need to shut it down in emergencies or whatever you can and that's the switch there. on the battery no the switch that's on the handlebars is for your programming mm -hmm. and for your power, your main power. The switch that's on the battery that comes with this kit is a secondary that kills everything. So if you ever did have an issue with something going haywire, 
the switch that's on the battery will kill the entire system. What's on the handlebars just kills the monitor and kills the motor temporarily. So you have, it's like a backup system is what you have. And if you're going to do any programming at all, it all takes place on the panel that's over there by the handlebars on top by the brick yard. Okay, so in this particular screen we talked about, there's not really a whole lot of information or at least rarely available information about this screen. So when you were in here, um, when you jump into the advanced settings, was that something you can do with the keypad or is it something you have to plug into a computer to get to any of the editable items here? Yeah, there's very little you can edit on those screens. It's, it's pretty much just a pedal assist kind of thing is what it is. If you want to go in and change anything else, you really first and foremost, you need to know what you're doing and you do have to get the cable from someone who sells it for $25, $30 and you have to have a proper Microsoft machine is what they typically use for their, for their open source. So you have to have a Microsoft laptop or a Surface or something to be able to program it and know what you're doing. Okay, so all of us Mac users, all of us creative types are kind of out of the out of the loop there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, <laughs> they they say they'll do Mac, but yeah, it's pretty complicated trying to do it on Mac. So, okay, so I guess that sounds like the biggest thing when you are planning a conversion kit is to plan the conversion kit. So you get the conversion kit, and even then, you need to know where you're running these things. Maybe you're gonna have to come up with some workarounds for some specific things. We'll talk about those in a little bit. And once you get the planning done, you're starting to put those main components in there, making sure all of the controls are easily accessible. And then let's talk about what you had to do to get this to run properly. So from what I understand in us talking previously was that this wasn't really a plug and play sort of scenario. Something that uh, you had mentioned you would probably push people who didn't have the knowledge towards a hub drive kit. And so I just wonder if you could walk us through some of the things you had to do to get it to function right and then some of the maybe not necessarily cons about it, but some of the things that you had to overcome and some of the things that, unless you have the correct amount of knowledge, might not be able to do by yourself. Yeah, programming programming is probably the biggest issue with these things. You have to be able to program them to your writing style and you have to actually know what your writing style is. Where like hub motors, for example, if you buy a bike that's already a pre-existing hub motor system, um, especially the front hub motors, they're, they're really just pretty much a bolt-on kind of thing and go, everything just plugs in and does it. Whereas the mid drives, you have to kind of calculate gearing, you have to calculate programming for your pedal assist and what level of pedal assist you're using, how much you get, you know, and stuff like that. And what your cadence is on the bike. Whereas if you do a hub motor, it's pretty much like a motorcycle. It's just in the rear wheel or front wheel. And you just kind of either throttle and go or you can do pedal assist either way. And the mid drives, you have gearing involved, you have to shift gears, you have to know how to shift gears, you have to know how to be in the proper gear for the proper speed. So there's a lot more technical stuff you have to be able to do when you're riding a mid drive versus when you're riding a hub motor. And you told me earlier that you kind of compared the mid drive motor to a manual car. So it's like driving stick yeah. on a car as opposed to just an automatic transmission. Yeah, or a semi truck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got multiple things going on. <laughs> so. They're a lot of fun, you know, they're entertaining and they're really practical for a lot of reasons, but you just have to really know what you're getting into before you get into it. And so let's say somebody looks at a mid-drive kit, they say, hey, I've got the knowledge, I think this is something that I could tackle. Who do you see this being ideal for, like the mid-drive kit as opposed to say like the hub drive kits? Somebody who has limited, you know, um, mobility and stuff sometimes, if you've got bad knees, you know, bad backs, if you've got, you know, different things like that that are going on, or you need that assistance. You can even put trailers behind them, you know, with the kids and stuff and the dog in them if you know how to shift and know how to do everything. So it really does help out if you have back problems, knee problems, you know, things like that, where you would need some extra assistance and you couldn't just pedal nonstop, especially when it's hotter outside and you need some extra assistance. If you got hills, different things like that, you know, and stuff where you can use that mid drive to get you through that extra, like commute, you know, if you're doing like a short commute to work and back or something, you know, four mile, five mile commute back and forth to work, or college, this stuff is pretty cool, you know, cause it's really easy to carry, take with you. It doesn't weigh that much. And so, you know, it, it's it's got its values and it's got its points, you know, of interest and things. But like I said, if you're just trying to get something that's a no brainer, it's real simple. Hub motors typically tend to be more simple and they tend to be more less maintenance than what a mid-drive does. So it just depends on whether you're one of those people who like to tinker, or if you're one of those people who wants to just get on it and go, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And so there's a few components on here that don't look like they came with the kit. So I wanna ask you about those, but before I do that, were there any tools 
that you had to have that were specialty tools. Now, Allen keys, people probably have some of those hanging around, a screwdriver, they probably have that. Was there anything special that you needed to pull this off? Not really, no. They're, they're, it's all, like I said, if you've got standard issued tools, you got wrenches and screwdrivers and Allen wrenches and different things like that, you can do pretty much everything that this kit's going to need. There's no, well, you. I take that back. You might have to have a crank puller for the existing cranks to mm. get them off the bike because you do have to pull your bottom bracket and your crank arms off of the existing bike. So that would be something, but they're all over online, internet. You can find them anywhere for $15, $20, so they're not really expensive tools. Um, but that's probably about the only thing you would need something special for is to, to get the existing cranks and bottom bracket out of the bike frame that you're working with currently. Okay, so and if that's already done for you before you start the whole process, might not be something you have to get. No, you wouldn't need it because like I said, you'd have an empty hole so you could go from there. Okay, and then getting back to some of the components, what were some of the components that you switched out from the kit or things that you upgraded? Like I noticed that the pedals were different. The yeah. other pedals that came with, I believe, were a little bit bigger, um, metallic yeah. construction. Yeah, they were pretty heavy pedals. They were pretty gaudy and big. And So I changed that out, and I changed out the gearing on it, too, because the front sprocket is pretty steep. It's a real tall gear, which means it's more likely that you could burn up the controller if you run that steep of a gear. And so it, the smaller gearing on it gives you a lot more versatility as far as power goes and torque if you're trying to pull the kids in the trailer or the dogs or whatever, you have a lot lower gearing on it, so you can actually do a lot more torque with the bike. Whereas if you're trying to do road stuff where you're trying to get out on the road and do 45, 50 miles an hour on the road with traffic, then the bigger gear would be something you would want on there. So it just kind of depends on what kind of riding you're gonna do. But yeah, that's an aftermarket, what they call a bling ring is what they call that. And it's, it's a pretty nice setup. It's actually uh, pretty nice. It's all anodized aluminum. And so you definitely get what you pay for when it comes to that kit. Okay, and so going back to the, the bling ring, how much did that run you aftermarket? Uh, 125 to 175 depending on where you get it from and who's selling it to. Okay, so just something to keep in mind, like if your riding style is maybe a little bit kind of, you're kind of quick and nimble, you're kind of in, you're kind of out, you want to do some, some scooting around. Yeah, then... or off-road too. If you're, doing, if you're doing mountain biking type stuff where you've got it on a mountain bike, full suspension, you definitely want that smaller ring because a couple of things, one, ground clearance, and, mm. and you're always taking off real short turns and stops and climbing hills. So you need that bottom end torque on that mountain bike, a full suspension bike. Whereas if you're on a road bike, you would need that taller gear. So you have to keep in mind too, if you're building a mountain bike or a road bike type setup too as well, because that comes into play. They actually, the smallest they make is a 40 tooth. That's a 42 tooth on the front. And the lowest you can go is a 40 simply because of clearance issues. So you just have to decide what you're gonna build, whether it's road, or whether it's mountain bike or if the hills are big or small or whatever you're trying to do with it. Okay, so we walked through a little bit of the the setup process and some of the things that you had to change. It looks like there's not really too many special tools, just that crank puller if that is something that you have to do with your pre-existing frame. Now I did notice a few things, a few additions, or should I say subtractions, with the battery in particular. So over here on the right hand side, it looks like there's a hole there. I believe there wasn't a hole there before. So what did, what was the reasoning behind making that hole and what does that what does that give you? Uh, well that that was all the politics that I pulled out of the battery pack. It's there's a whole lot of different connection issues and things that they put in these packs. So I made it better wiring, better connectors. I use gold bullet connectors which gives you more current that gets into the politics of stuff. But that's the reason why there's a hole there is because I took all that out and put better plugs, better wiring just to make the bike more efficient make it run longer on charge and give you a little bit more power than what it would typically for a stock battery pack. So unless you're really into technical, I'd probably just use it stock as far as that goes. Okay, so nothing that's gonna be a, a detriment if you use it the way it comes, but if you're looking to get that little extra juice, then there's some modifications you can do as well. Yeah, yeah, there's always room for improvement on everything we buy today, so. Okay, and then on the other side, I noticed the, uh, the switch, is it the same? It's sticking out of the battery a little bit. Right? Yeah, it was actually mounted inside the case over here whenever I got it, so I, I moved it and relocated it. That's okay. what it was. That's your main kill switch for the battery, which is nice too. For If you have the battery in an accessible location and you do need to kill the whole system for any reason, you can kill it with that switch, which is really a nice feature too on that battery because it's like a safety kind of thing, you know? Okay. Okay, so 
you've got the mod, everything is set up, we've got it running smoothly. Now what's the what's the fastest you've gone on this bike? Thirty five miles per hour. And when you were you were going downhill? No. Flat flat okay. ground, no wind, no back, no nothing. Just flat ground, thirty five miles an hour. I'm excited to try that out. Yeah. That is exciting. The other thing that's kind of interesting here, and this is just kind of, you know, from my perspective, is over here on the right hand side we've got uh, it's the friction shifter. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of that's an old school thing. Yeah, right? it's old school. Yeah, that's that's how it used to be back in the days, man. The eighties and nineties was friction. And it works better on this one because it was a, a fold it's a folding bike frame, which means it's got a little bit different derailleur rear derailleur on it. And so it was a kind of a cadence thing where the shifter had to match up with the gearing on it and stuff. So that's why I changed it out and that that's one really peculiar point about these mid-drive systems is you have to make sure you have a good solid drivetrain because they're pretty destructive when it comes to force and torque. Mm. So you always have to make sure you have a really good drivetrain and you have a really smooth shifting system because these things are pretty brutal on drivetrain. And so that's something I, I remember in the beginning you were talking about getting everything to match up and you likened it to driving a semi-truck because there's a lot of things that you have to do as a person that normally like for example with the mid drives or with the uh, the hope motors they do all that stuff for you so you have to be thinking about what gear you're in how much you know power that you're giving it because you can burn out a lot of this stuff if you're not paying attention yeah because they're they're not real tolerant on overload which means you're you're in too high of a gear and you're going too slow of a speed and so you can actually toast them pretty quick if you don't know how to shift and how to get things in the proper gearing for you know what you're trying to do if you're climbing hills you need to be in a lower gear uh, if you're you know you're just going downhill you can obviously go up so you really need to know what you're doing when it comes to shifting on a bike and stuff because it's real crucial on the mid drives because it does run the power through the drivetrain so it's using your existing gearing to get the proper torque that it needs to be able to perform the way it's supposed to perform mm. okay yeah that's i think for me probably one of the bigger points was besides some of the all the small little things that you have to tweak to make everything run right, it was now you have got a lot of the responsibility when you're riding this bike as opposed to just like, oh, the computer can handle it. You gotta be thinking, you gotta listen to the drivetrain, you gotta listen to the motor, make sure that everything's running the Smoothly. way. Yeah, and it's normally the way that, you know, the hub drive motors would do that, the computer does that, but now it's it's up to you, you're the computer. Yeah, you're the computer because like I said, you're on a hub drive, on a rear hub wheel, it just pretty much, it's a, from stop to go, and that's all you have to do you don't have to shift gears but on the mid drive it runs the power through the drivetrain whereas the hub motor is in the back wheel so it's an isolated unit so it works if you're kind of one of those people who doesn't want to do much you know when you're riding you just want to get out and tour the rear hub motor stuff is probably more your speed okay and going back to the rear back here on this bike we've got you set up the magnet sensor a little bit differently there's a few things you had to do to make this work on this particular bike. Um, would you walk me through that? And then at the end of that, would you say that this is something that's specific to this wheel and wheel dimension, that, you know, something you had to work around with the frame, or this is something that most people will probably have to do a little bit of tweaking on to make it work correctly? Yeah, it's a universal. So that's a 20 inch wheel, so that made it a little bit more challenging. But yeah, you're gonna have to find the perfect location for the magnet and for the sensor on whatever size wheel you got, if you have 20 inch, 24 inch, 26, 28, 29, whatever you've got, you're gonna have to find the right location for everything to be mounted. So it's a very important part of the system because without the magnet pickup, it won't run. So you do have to actually do some kind of calculating and some technical work to get that thing in the right location so it clears, doesn't get caught up in your drive terrain. And, and it registers the right speed is the other thing that you have to do. You have to go in and tell it which size wheel you've got and that way it knows how fast you're going because otherwise your speed is going to be off and it will throw the programming and the cadence and stuff in the hub motor or the mid drive system off so you need to be able to know how to get all that stuff set up properly okay so that's sounds like it's a crucial part of the uh, the whole operation there yeah it's so very if, important and if you bump that off or you hit it or you you know you bend it somehow and it's not functioning correctly or you knock it off and you just lose it period you're not you're not motoring home. No, nope, you're pedaling home. You're working out. Yeah, you're working out. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, I think that pretty much covers a lot of it. Sounds like there's some good insight for people who would be looking at doing a mid drive as opposed to a rear hub. Um, is there any last comments you'd like to make about either this system or uh, commenting on the the hub motor system? Um, 
I'll let you do that. And then after that, we'll go ahead and take it out for the ride test. Cool. It, it's a fun bike to ride. I mean, it's been, you know, a lot of fun to build. So if you're the person who likes to tinker with stuff and build things, it, it's a fun project. You know, they're, they've got a lot of modifications you can do to them, a lot of tweaking and different things that can take place. So they're, they're fun for that reason. You just have to be the right type of person to want to build one. Okay. All right, guys. Well, you heard it here first from our confidential source, also Mitch. And we will hop on here and we'll take it out for, uh, for a little ride test. All right, guys, we have talked about the conversion kit. Now it is time for us to test it out a little bit. This isn't going to be our normal in-depth ride review sort of business, but I'm going to get on it and see what it can do. It's a little bit faster than it looks. Guys, it's a little bit faster than it looks. And uh, we just did a couple laps here. Everything looks like it's functioning well. And that is gonna do it for our review slash collaboration with Also Mitch. If you guys have any questions about this kit in particular, or just the mid drive versus the hub drive as well, let us know down in the comments. Love talking to you guys. We'll catch you on the next one.